Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. I have the honor and the privilege to launch this new series called Habits of Grace. Um, Why did we call it Habits of Grace? I I think the best way I could put it is is this way. Um, When you look around in the world right now and uh, you look at the culture all around, there's a lot of toxicity happening all around us. And it's affecting our people. It's affecting our emotional health, our spiritual health, our mental health. I mean, can anyone agree with that? Is, is that true? You turn on the TV, you, you get anxious. And our hope is that we get to answer that. What is the answer to that? Well, we believe God has given us these means of grace, these spiritual disciplines that we believe that as believers, if you would practice and, and you would immerse yourself in, it, it, it would cause you to have a healthy spiritual life. So um, with that said, if we could stand for the reading of God's word, I'm going to jump right in. Book of Matthew, chapter number three and chapter number four, um, I'm going to flow right into it. So Jesus is about to start his public ministry and uh, he's getting baptized and that's, that's where we're going to pick up. So chapter number three, verse 16, it says, And when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Chapter four, verse one, goes right into it. Then... Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Verse 7 Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and you shall and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came And we're ministering to him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray, God, that tonight, this this morning, rather, that this morning would be transformative for us, oh God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you allow this word to sink in deep. That's a big prayer, but you're a big God. And Lord, I just pray, God, that, that after today, God, you would teach us how to fight, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, as you take a seat, look to your neighbor and say, it is written. So my wife was um, the worship leader leading us up here. She's up here in the first row. She is God's greatest gift to me. Uh, We've been married now for seven years, right? I didn't get that wrong. Brownie points, hello. Hello. Um, and marriage has been great. And how many married people are in the room? So I don't have to tell you, marriage is, is a process of learning. Am I right? Like, it's just you're always learning 
something new. And I remember back in 2015, I married her sometime around 2016. As we were getting closer to, to, to Valentine's Day, um, my wife said something that appeared to be random. But this is something I learned about my wife, that if she ever tells me something that appears to be random, write it down because it's not random. Right. So I'm, I'm in the living room. I'm watching the game. I'm watching my man LeBron, you know, do his thing. And then she just comes out of nowhere and she's like, babe. Hello, babe. I'm like, what's up, babe? And she's like, I love flowers. <laughs> and I was like, a lot of women love flowers, babe. Yeah, I get it. Like, awesome. Yeah, I love flowers too. Like, you know. And she's all like, yeah, yeah, but I just want you to know, like, I don't love, like, big arrangements of flowers. Like, I don't love, like, you know, like, big, complicated flowers. I love simple flowers. My favorite flowers are hydrangeas and peonies. Did I get that right? Brownie points number two. Let's go. She's like, those are the flowers that I love. I'm like, okay, great. Now, fast forward a couple, you know, some, some time later, Valentine's Day is coming up. Money's a little tight. And she looks at me and she says, hey, babe, I don't want to do anything. You know, I, we don't need to get anything for each other this Valentine's Day. We'll just have a romantic dinner at home and, and it's all good, right? And, and, and I was like, sure. <laughs> we, we're not going to get anything for each other, right? Like, you're, yeah, you're telling me the truth, right? Like, you expect me not to give you anything. Okay, sure. So back in New York City, where I'm from, right, we don't drive places. Like, there's no need to drive. We have, like, public transportation. You, can, you, got, a, you got the stores, right, and, like, right across the street from you. So I'm walking home from work, and I'm running out of time, right, and, and I'm running late to dinner, to our, valen- to our romantic Valentine's Day dinner. And I'm like, as I'm walking, right, because it was a long day at work, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I forgot the most important thing about Valentine's. I forgot to get my wife flowers. So then I start to, I, I start to panic, and I'm like, okay, I I got to go get her flowers. So, so it's Valentine's Day. I'm like, one of these shops needs to have a beautiful arrangement of flowers somewhere, right? So I start walking down. I go towards my favorite coffee shop. And then there's this funeral home. And, and, and there's like a flower shop attached to this funeral home. So I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go there. And so I walk in and I'm, I'm, I'm pressed for time. So I'm walking in. And I'm kind of screaming a little bit. I, I raise my voice. I'm like, hey, I need help. I need flowers. Give me the most biggest, most beautiful set of flowers you have and the guy's like hey sir um why don't you take a look at this big old basket of flowers right here it's gonna it's gonna cost I was like don't worry about what it's gonna cost I put my card on the table I was like charge the card charge the card just just get it ready for me I gotta go we're not gonna talk about how much it costs because my kids ain't going to college now but he gets this arrangement of flowers ready. I pick it up. I start walking home, and I'm feeling good about myself. I'm like, you know, she's not expecting anything from me, and I got this big old beautiful arrangement of flowers. I'm looking across the street. I'm feeling so good about myself. I see a couple guys across the street carrying, like, one rose for their woman. I'm like, Pfft. Look at you, one rose walking guy across the street. Look, I, I got this big old basket of flowers. She's going to love this basket of flowers. I get home, and the, the, the aroma of just goodness just hits my nose, right? My wife is preparing this, this amazing meal. And, and so I try to sneak up upstairs, right? And, and she's in the kitchen, and, and I place the big old arrangement of flowers there in, in such a way where, like, she turns the corner and she'll be able to see it. And then, you know, I just, I just do the whole, um, <clears throat> hey, babe, daddy's home. I'm j- just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> we didn't have kids at the time. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm like, hey, babe. She's like, hi, honey, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Um, hey, I, I, I know you said we weren't going to get anything for each other, but I, I just want you to take a look at something real quick. And she turns the corner, sees this big old beautiful arrangement of flowers, and she's all like, aww. Thank you. See, it's quiet in the room because you guys caught what I caught. Something was wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I'm like, what's wrong? What, what's wrong with her right now? I, I don't understand what's going on. So I'm like, what happened? You don't like it? She's like, no, babe, it's okay. Let's just, let's just have dinner. And then I'm all like, no, 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 no. Let's talk about it. Like, do we have to pray against the spirit of like, like ungratefulness? Like, what is going? What's going on? What is going on? And then she looks at me and she says, babe, I, I, I love you. Thank you for getting me the flowers. But I just, I just don't like when you don't listen to me. 
And I'm like, what, what you mean? I was like, you remember a couple weeks ago when I told you what kind of flowers I like? And I said I didn't like, oh, like a big arrangement of flowers and all that. And, and then I start feeling bad about myself. And then she starts walking towards this basket. True story. Starts walking towards this basket, right? And in this basket, there's this little ugly teddy bear. I think he's ugly now, right? This little ugly teddy bear. And he's holding up a sign. And as she gets closer, she's like, babe, where, where did you get this basket of flowers. And I was like, by that, by that um, shop next to the, you know, to the place. And then she goes, babe, read the sign. The teddy bear is holding up a sign and it said, rest in peace. <laughs> I had to think quick on my feet. So I was like, baby, it's because you work so hard. I just want you to rest. And I want you to be peaceful about it. Guys, here's the problem. The problem is that I neglected my wife's words. I neglected what she said. In other words, I failed to give proper attention to what she told me. When you neglect the words of a person, you're neglecting the person themselves. And in the same way, when you neglect God's word, you're neglecting God himself. And when you neglect God and his word, here's what happens. You cause damage to your soul, to your spirit, and to your mind. And as I said, as I was opening up today, when I, when I told you about the series, we're living in such a toxic culture that is filled with deceit, filled with hate, and an overload of information on how to be happy and how to be satisfied that is in straight contradiction to the word of God and the ways that Christ has called us to live. See, it's no wonder why so many Christians find themselves confused with what's in front of them right now in this season. It's no wonder why parents are struggling to give their children answers on how to live as a light in a dark time in this season. I believe it's because for a lot of us, we've gotten away from the word of God. And I believe that the answer to that, and I believe this with all my heart, it is for us to get back to the word of God. Psalm 119, 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How many people know that we're living in a dark time? And if it's not for the word of God, we wouldn't know whether to turn left, whether to turn right, whether to go straight, whether to stop. The word of God is literally our only source of our only source of comfort in times like this. We need the, the word of God to point us where we should go each and every single day. And here's the thing. The word of God and the spirit of God, it's the advantage that you and I have. But when I say advantage, I don't mean in the context of sports, right? Like when you're taller, stronger, faster, quicker than your opponent. We're not talking about a sport here. See, Ephesians 6, 17, Paul describes the word of God as the sword of the spirit. Now, how many people know those are fighting words? Those are fighting words. We don't have an advantage so that we can play games with our enemy. We have an advantage so we can wage war against our enemy. In the same book, in the same chapter, in the earlier verse, he says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and in the heavenly places. Friends, we are in a spiritual fight. Some of you guys wonder, why is it so hard for me to want to go to church? It's because there is spiritual warfare happening in your life right now. And the enemy doesn't want you to be seated in the presence of God. There are people wondering, why don't I have joy? Why don't I have the joy in serving God like I used to anymore? It's because you are in the middle of a battle and you forgot you've been in a battle. There are Christians that are walking around and they are spiritually beat up. Because they don't acknowledge the battle that they're in. And so, in today's text, Jesus, he shows us how to fight this spiritual battle. And as we walk through these verses, I just want you to pay attention to Satan, the tempter, the, 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 uh, the devil, his tactics... Because I believe that there's still the same old tactics that he tries to use with you and I here today. 
So here we go. So Jesus was just baptized. It's the start of his public ministry. And look at what the text says. Verse 16 says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God, like a dove, descending on, coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So let's put the pieces together. We have God the Father affirming Jesus the Son and saying, I am pleased with him. So after you read that, you don't really expect what comes next, right? God is pleased with Jesus, but then immediately it says, verse 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, when I first read that, I said, hold on, wait a minute. Someone make this make sense. God is pleased with Jesus and yet leads him into a wilderness. Let me give you some context here. I'm, I'm going to unpack this a little bit. Just bear with me. The words to tempt here in the text, parazo, it also means to test. So the better way of looking at this verse is, is that the Spirit of God led Jesus to the wilderness to be tested. And here's why it's important. If you pay close to the details here, the gospel writer is making it obvious to his audience the retelling of the Old Testament through this narrative of Jesus' life. Let me explain. Many years before, God chooses a man. His name was Moses. Anybody familiar with Moses? Raise your hand if you know who I'm talking about. God chooses a man named Moses to lead his people out of slavery. And he does this by splitting the waters of the Red Sea. And as they go through the Red Sea, they start their journey to the promised land. And a journey that should have lasted a couple of days resulted in these people wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. Side note, disobedience to God's word will have you stuck in your situation a lot longer than you have to be. And here we have Jesus, right? So the connections are obvious here. Here we have Jesus going through the waters of baptism and being led into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. The reason he was led into the wilderness was to fulfill his purpose of being a perfect savior. He did the very thing that no man or woman could do. Keep God's word perfectly and die a death that we deserve so that you and I can live. That's really good news for us in the room. Because that means that there is no good deed that we can ever do that, that would cause us to be saved. The, 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 God, the, the, the apostle Paul says that our best deeds are like filthy rags. So this is, this is a picture of Jesus literally saying to you and I, I am living the life that you can't live in order to so you can have life. And I, I want to make that clear for people because what the enemy will try to do is that he will try to make you believe you're not good enough for God's grace. But God's grace says, I know you're not good enough and that's why you have grace. I don't know who I'm talking to in the room, but there's some people in the room, you got to get yourself out of this spiritual timeout you've been putting yourself in. Because God is ready to use you. He's ready to invest in you. He's ready to elevate you. He's ready to move you forward. He's ready to say, hey, I lived that life so you didn't have to live it. Not that we, not that we are disobedient to the word of God, but we know that we have the grace to lean on so when we fall, we can get right back up. So this is what's happening in the text. Jesus is living the life we couldn't live for ourselves. But here's the question. Nobody likes to go through testing, right? I would walk... True story. One time, I, 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 I was not a guy. God saved me from a whole lot. I was not a good student growing up. Like, you, you got that girl right there that I can tell you. I, I caused headaches for my teachers, right? And I remember I hated tests so much. And, and you know what I hated more? I hated pop quizzes. Because, like, you never knew when they were coming up. It's just like one day, you know, you're having a great old day. You're, like, you know, talking to your friends. You know, you did your homework. You did all that. And you sit down. And on the one, one day of the one month you decide to actually do your homework and you think everything's going to be okay, now you got a pop quiz. I hate pop quizzes. But here's the thing. Even though we don't like testing, we got to ask ourselves the question, why do we go through testing? Because if you're a believer, newsflash, you're going to go through testing. And here's the answer. It's to test our character for our purpose to bring God glory. 
Why do we go through testings as Christians? It's to test our character for our purpose to bring God's glory. 1 Peter 12, through, um, verse 12 through 14 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes up upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. Hmm. In our text earlier, it says that the spirit of God came like a dove and rested on Jesus. And now this text is saying that the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you and I. Friends, the same spirit that led Jesus is the same spirit that leads you and I. The same spirit that tests Jesus is the same spirit allowing us to be tested to work out this godly character in our lives. Now back to our text today. The text says that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and it says Jesus was hungry. And the tempter came and said this. He said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But what did God say about Jesus when he came out of the water? He said, this is my beloved son. God identifies Jesus as his son, and now Satan's first words to come out of his mouth is to attack on the very thing that God just identified. Isn't that crazy? God will give you a word, and as soon as you receive that word, you confirm it's a word from God. That is the thing the enemy will start to attack. Your family's going to be saved. Oh, he's going to start attacking that thought right there. Oh, you think they're going to be saved, but look, they're worse than they've ever been before. And, and that's the way the enemy works. You'll always be alone. No, you're not. I got somebody for you. No, you're always going to be alone. Nobody likes you. How can somebody like who you are and all these things? That's what the enemy does. He attacks the very thing that God says. Even from the first pages of Genesis, we see the serpent questioning the word of God to, to, to Eve and, and her falling for his, for his deceit. It's the same old tactics. And now here's the question. What does he use to attack the identity of Christ? If you are the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. He uses his physical desire to eat. I'll put it to you this way. Married folks, we're, we're, we're called to be faithful in our marriages. But Satan will use your physical desires to attack the faithful part. Oh, he don't care if you're married. He just cares if you're faithful. That's what he does. And there's something to say about submitting to our physical desires over God's word. That's an actual attack to our identity in Christ. I feel like one of the biggest things in our culture right now is people struggling with identity. And it's really important to, 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 to track where that's being attacked. And for a lot of people, it starts right there. It starts at what is your flesh craving? Not your spirit. What is your flesh craving? What is the enemy attacking? What is he trying to distort in your life? Now, here's, here's what's interesting. He uses what appears to be truth to deceive. That's, that's how, that's how um, crafty the enemy is. He uses some truth. He's like, hey, if you're the son of God, turn these, turn these stones into bread. And as you read later in the gospel, Jesus is in front of a multitude of people who are hungry, and he takes five loaves and two fish and multiplies it and feeds thousands so he can do the very thing the enemy is asking him to do. The enemy is going to ask you to do things that you can do. The question is, are you going to submit to what he's asking or are you going to submit to what the Spirit of God is asking you to do? Jesus responds. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is quoting scripture. He's wielding his sword. But he's not just quoting scripture for the sake of quoting scripture. He's quoting it because he believes it. What are you quoting in your life that you don't really believe? 
How many Christians have their favorite Bible verses up on a wall, up in their room, up in maybe a bumper sticker on their car? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength or whatever the favorite Bible verse of the day is. And they have it all up. They'll make a little graphic, put it on their Instagram, put it on their Twitter, on their Facebook. They'll do all of that. And when push comes to shove and things get tough and things get um, difficult in their lives, they forget about all these Bible verses they've been quoting their whole lives. Don't just quote scripture to quote scripture. Jesus quoted scripture because he believed the words of God were true. Satan now takes Jesus up on this pinnacle of the temple and he uses a strategy right out of Jesus' book to cause him to fall. He quotes scripture. (laughs) He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. He got that from a psalm. That's Satan quoting the Bible. See, Satan knows scripture too. And he probably knows it better than you and I. But that doesn't deter Jesus from using his sword. He continues to use scripture and may I add, he uses it in its proper context. He responds and he says, again, Satan, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Friends, studying and knowing God's word is so important because as the text reveals, one of Satan's tactics to get you to be deceived and get you to do the wrong thing is to use scripture out of context. Think about it. There were Christians that used to affirm slavery because of scripture out of context. There are religions and there are cults that that exist that are not godly by any means, but they use the Bible. The Bible outside of its context is not the word of God, friends. The Bible within its context is what has life and has power to change. It has power to transform. The enemy is not scared of scripture because he'll recite it back at you. What he's scared of is a believer that knows what the scripture means. That's what he's scared of. So he attacks his identity. Tyler, I'm going to ask you to come join me. He attacks his identity using his physical desire. He attacks his identity using scripture out of context. And now lastly, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Verse 10, then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, going right back to the sword. Look at him masterfully cutting up Satan, chopping him up right here. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. A little bit to unpack here. So now he attacks his identity by tempting him, tempting to give him the thing he already has. Think about that for a moment. He looks at Jesus, takes him to this high mountain, shows him these kingdoms and all their glory. And he says, I will give you all of this if you bow and worship me. Friends, we're talking about Jesus Christ, the the, the God that sits on the right hand of the Father. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about the Christ that already has all authority and all power and all dominion. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow down one day. But Satan has the audacity to look at Jesus and say, I will give you what you already have, what's already yours. See, what Satan is trying to do is he's trying to cause Jesus to take a shortcut to his purpose by bowing down to him. I don't know who I'm talking to. Lean into this for a moment. There are things in your life that God may have promised you. There are things in your life maybe you are waiting on and it just hasn't been the time yet. God hasn't fulfilled all his purposes in your life. God hasn't fulfilled all of his promises. That doesn't mean he's not going to do it. That just means you're in the waiting. That just means you're in the testing. But what happens is that when we're at our weakest, there's a reason why the, the writer tells us Jesus is hungry. 
You try giving up food and water for 40 days and 40 nights. Don't catch me if I miss lunch. You don't want to talk to me. Jesus is at his weakest point physically. We have to understand he was God, but he was, always, he was also fully man. He, he, he felt the weaknesses that you and I have, feel. So he feels hunger. He feels that craving to eat. Maybe his mind was blurry. I don't know. And here at his weakness, he attacks his purpose. And he literally says, hey, I'm going to give this to you. And all you got to do is bow and worship me. Here's what's interesting. Bow and worship me. Satan wants your worship. He wants your worship. He wants your praise. The text is making it obvious. He's not saying it in a nuanced way. He went right for it. He says, bow and worship me. But what does it look like to worship Satan? It's a tough teaching, but here's what I feel. I feel it's not doing the word of God. When we don't submit to the word of God, we are choosing a different Lord. We're choosing a different master. Some of us want marriages. Some of us want relationships. And God says, I have that for you. But he's offering you the shortcuts of the benefits of a relationship and a godly marriage a little bit sooner. And you're like, but I love him. I love her. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do it. We love each other and we love the Lord and we love each other. And I believe that may be true for you. But what does the word of God say? Some of us are, 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 are challenged with thoughts of maybe even lying to say, oh, I'm gonna just say a little white lie here and this lie ain't gonna hurt nobody and that lie ain't gonna hurt nobody and then we have this cycle of just being a liar and all these things and every time we choose to disobey the word of God, we're choosing a different Lord. Tempting to give him what's already his. As a child of God, there are things that are already yours, that God has purchased for you, that God has set aside for you. I don't know what season of life you find yourself in right now, but I encourage you, do not take the shortcut to what appears to be your purpose. All for the sake of, I'm just tired of waiting. I'm just tired of waiting. Satan looks at Jesus and he tells him, throw yourself down, right? This is before this part, right? He's like, throw yourself down and angels will come down and, and you know, they'll, they'll catch you and they'll do all that, right? That's what the word of God says. And Jesus doesn't submit. And isn't it interesting that it ends with this, verse 11, then the devil left him and behold, who were there? The devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. What God had for Jesus was always there. It was always there. That's a word for somebody in the room today. What God has for you, it's always been there. It's a matter of what you're submitting yourself to in this season. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. It is the only piece of armor that the Bible describes as an offensive weapon. And the reason it's an offensive weapon is because we, the church, are called to be offensive by nature. You ever notice, I, I didn't write this down, but just bear with me for a moment. You guys remember that moment where Jesus is looking at the disciples and he's like, hey, so what's the word on the street? What do they say? Who do they say that I am? You guys remember that story? And the disciples are like, hey, somebody say you're like Isaiah, John the Baptist, this person, that person. And Jesus is like, who do you say that I am? And Peter's like, well, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And Jesus is like, only God revealed that to you. And then what does he say? Here's what I want to lean in on for a moment. He says, 
You're Peter, the rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Gates are defensive by nature. The sword of the spirit is an offensive weapon. I think the problem in our time is that we have too many Christians being reactive and defensive when we're supposed to be uh, uh, active and offensive. The enemy is the one that should be on his heels as we're taking over territory for the kingdom of God. I believe that with my whole heart. As we share the gospel and we proclaim the name of Jesus to our co-workers, to our students, to our family members, to those in the street that we don't know, I believe that's literally us engaging in spiritual warfare and taking territory for the kingdom of God. But instead, we have so many people that just do not want to move. They don't want to say yes to what God is calling them to do. So now, and the enemy and his army is on the offense and you have Christians on the defense and that's not the way it was intended to be. The word of God is the weapon that pierces our enemy. The word of God, the scriptures cut him deep, causes him to run away. And so I wanna give you these three small points. One, make a habit of reading and studying the Word of God. Two, make a habit of applying the Word of God. And three, make a habit of using the Word of God to fight back. Jesus didn't just stand there. He fought back. I'll close with this. When, um, when, I was, when I was younger, I think I said this before, right? I didn't, I didn't grow up in the best neighborhood, right? There was a lot of conflict and all that. Um, I remember I, I had a bully growing up. I know what you're thinking. You're like, not you, Pastor Joaquin, the guy your size, not you. But I had a bully. It's true. I had a bully. And, um, and I remember, um, yeah, he would get in my face and he would push me around at the park and all that. And, and, and you know, he, we were the same age, but he was obviously eating his Twinkies and Popeyes because he was like way bigger than me. Like he was, he was, we were, we were the same age, but we weren't the same age kind of thing, right? And um, I remember one day um, I come home and I have this black eye and um, I was trying to like hide it from my, from my family, right? I don't know if anyone can relate to that. Um, I, I was trying to hide it and um, my dad, he, he catches it. And he's like, hey, he's like, hey, mijo, come here. I'm like, yeah, dad. He goes, hey, what happened to your eye? And I try to lie. I'm like, you know, dad, I just, I was playing and the soccer ball hit me right in the eye and, and that's all it was. And he's like, hey, you're lying. What happened? Tell me right now. And I was like, yeah, this guy just, this guy just punched me in the face. And what you got to understand is that I was nervous telling my dad the truth because my culture is the kind of culture where like, if you pick a fight with one of us, everybody's coming. So like, my dad's coming, my mom's coming, my tia's coming, my tio's coming. If my cousin just had a baby, he's fighting too. Like, everybody's just gonna, everybody's gonna fight. And so he, he, he bends down, he looks at me. He's like, hey, let me tell you something. And I'm not condoning this, by the way, right? Just bear with me, just lean into the story. He's like, hey, look, I, I, I didn't raise you to be a bully. So I don't want you to ever bully people. He's like, Miho, I want you to try to avoid the fight if you can possibly avoid it. If you can run away, run away. If you can get out of there, get out of it. Ignore it, ignore it. But there are going to be times where your back is up against the wall. And you're going to have no choice. And then he looks at my hands. He goes, you see those two fists? Those two hands? They make fists. Fight back. Man, you missed it. See, we have too many Christians that have dropped their weapon in this season. There are too many Christians that have not been reading the Word of God. They have not been using the Word of God. And the enemy is literally bullying you in this season. He's playing park with your mind. He's playing games with your heart and your soul. 
And the word of the Lord today is, hey, pick up your sword and fight back. You got words that will cut deep. You just have to access it. He's made it available to you. Fight back. The spirit of God is the same spirit that gives us the courage to fight back. Because I know there are some people in the room that would say, Joaquin, I am just so exhausted. I'm just so exhausted. It's every day. I can't catch a break. My soul feels weary. My heart feels heavy. My mind feels clouded. My friend, you're in spiritual warfare. Every head bowed, every eye closed. He's given us all access to his word. And he doesn't just give us his word. He, the Bible says that when Jesus ascended to the heavens, that he, he, he gave us a helper by the name of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, he's the one that makes sense of the words of God on these pages for us. So as you read the Bible, you're not reading it by yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. Ask the Holy Spirit to open up your mind. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you courage to read this book. Sometimes it takes courage. Ask the Holy Spirit. And here's the beauty behind it is that you're asking the Holy Spirit to do the very thing he loves to do. But, but like I said a moment ago, and I just feel this in my heart, so we'll, we'll pray this way. There are people in the room, and I feel it, that are just exhausted. They're, they're, they're feeling weary, and, they, and you know you need prayer. And you need that courage. And you need the Lord to add the winds back into your sail. I want to pray for you. All I'm going to ask you to do is raise a hand and put it right back down. If that's you, raise a hand, put it down. I see you. 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 I see you all on this side. I see you in the balcony. I see you. I see you. If you would say, Joaquin, I want to read the word, but I'm so discouraged. Just raise a hand and put it down. I see you. Thank you. I see you. I see you. Joaquin, I want to I read the word, but I, 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 I'm actually afraid I won't understand it. I, I just want to pray for you. Raise a hand and put it down. I see you. Great. I see you. Father, we come before you, God. Jesus, first and foremost, we thank you for living the life we couldn't live, oh God. We thank you that you are our perfect savior. We thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, oh God. God, I thank you because your word says that, God, you're, you're close to the brokenhearted, God. And for some reason, I just feel a sense that there are broken hearts in this room right now, God. There are people that are going through different experiences in their lives, oh God, and, and right now their, their minds may be clouded, their hearts may be heavy, their souls may be weary, oh God, and, and, and Lord God, we, we pray that you do the very thing you said you can do, and that's restore joy, oh God. God, would you restore joy back into your church today, oh God? Holy Spirit, would you give us the courage to step out and, and, and engage with your word like never before, oh God? Would you give us the faith that we need to trust the words on these pages, oh God? Because they're transformative, oh God. They're life-changing, oh God. God, this is the weapon you decided to give us, oh God. And so, Lord, I'm praying for that courage to, to engage in the spiritual warfare like never before. To not be afraid, oh God, because what I love about the text today is that nowhere in the text says that Jesus was ever afraid of Satan, oh God. 
And it was your spirit that led him there. That's the same spirit that we have, God. So if we have that same spirit, Lord, there is nothing for us to fear, oh God. Satan can't hold a candle to you, oh God. Satan is beneath our feet, oh God. There is not a promise he can touch. There is not a person he can he can damage, God, without even your approval, oh God. So, Spirit of the living God, I pray that you would restore our souls, oh God. Give us life, oh God. We're living in this time of toxicity, God. Would you give us the love that we need, the grace that we need, the forgiveness that we need, oh God, to keep on going, to put a smile on our face, oh God, to engage with those co-workers, to engage with those friends, to engage with those family members, oh God, and say there is a God, and He is real, and He is active, and He is working, Look at my life. I used to have thoughts of suicide. I don't have them anymore. I used to be depressed. I don't have that anymore. God, that will be the testimony of those that are in the room, oh God. I used to struggle with that. I don't struggle anymore. I used to be angry and bitter. I don't struggle with that anymore. I used to have unforgiveness in my heart. I don't struggle with that anymore. I used to be afraid to share the gospel with people. I don't struggle with that anymore. Because the enemy is at work and the enemy is destroying lives out there, God. And I don't want to be the type of believer that is sitting with the gospel on their lap, oh God. I want to be able to proclaim your word to the nations, proclaim the word to the cities, oh God, to the neighborhoods, oh God. Because if we believe this gospel changed our life, we have to believe it can change this world, oh God. So God, do what only you can do.